introduce our speaker to you. He uh, is a physician, now photographer. He's done other programs for us. His photographs are beautifully breathtaking. And he actually purposefully chooses places that will photograph well when he takes his vacations. So here is Michael Patrick. the word Patagonia, it sort of evokes something mysterious, exotic, maybe mythical. But rather than be the, like the mythical and exotic Shangri-La that FDR used in World War II to refer to his supposed presidential secret retreat, this is not mythical, but it is exotic. National Geographic called this one of the five most beautiful spots on the planet. And I think that those who have been there would probably agree with it. At any rate, um, you may be familiar with, the, uh, with Patagonia if you read the wonderful book uh, Bruce Chatwin wrote called In Patagonia in 1977. Or you might recall it as the getaway place for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Yes, you know that. Or you might just think it's a nice high-end clothing brand. <laughs> At any rate, what I'd like to do is to share with you some of the mystery that we found when Bev and I, along with a small group of mostly photographers and those who simply wanted to go, it's actually a small group, when we visited uh, this last year, um, which would have been right around this time, according to them. It was in, in April, so it was in their fall. First of all, for those of you who want a little bit of a geo geographical uh, reference point, the circled area is what is called Patagonia, shared between Argentina Argentina and Chile. It is a long haul uh, from any uh, airport in, in the United States. Your first destination would be the yellow dot just above that circle, which is the capital of Chile, Santiago, and then another four and a half hours to <coughs> the town of Punta Arenas, which sits as the most southernmost uh, city in South America. Uh, this sits right on the Straits of Magellan, right across from Tierra del Fuego. Tierra del Fuego uh, is called the Land of Fla uh, Fires, and it was named that by uh, uh, Magellan because he saw fires that he thought were set by natives there, and so he said, well, it must be the Land of Fires. The, actually, the word Patagonia comes from uh, the word Patagon, and this was, again, something that uh, Magellan used, and it refers to a character of great size in the 16th century Spanish novel, so I read. And so, uh, anyway, he said, well, this must be the land of the Patagons, and we have just haven't changed it since then, and neither have they. And now it turns out that uh, most anthropologists uh, believe that the, uh, the natives um, in that area were in fact much larger than the Europeans in, in Magellan's time. Um, the shaded area on the left is the region of, of, um, that's called Patagonia. As you can see, there's no boundaries. It's just sort of a place, uh, a state of mind almost. But the insert uh, shows you the area that, that of interest to us here. Down at the bottom, you see the Tierra del Fuego, the Straits of Magellan, and Punta Reynas. Our, our merry little band had a, a small van that accommodated about 11 to 12 people. And we wended our way up about 150 miles 
through uh, that area of, of Patagonia, which is uh, mainly um, arid steppes, unforested grassland. And it's uh, it very remote and desolate looking, but it has its own strange beauty, as I'll show you in a few minutes. The destination was the, um, the national park called Torres del Paine. And uh, this is truly one of the most magnificent places on the planet. The gateway to that is the town of Puerto Natales. This, this, uh, these are just some internet shots I got, just so you can see what a town like uh, Punta Arenas is, because you have this feeling that, my God, this is the most southernmost city in the, in, the, in the world. And it must be um, almost like a, a frontier town. But it isn't. It's actually a thriving place. It's the jumping off point for cruise ships that go down to Antarctica, as well as those people like us that go overland from there. But it's a very thriving community, about the size of Madison. This map shows you something that uh, uh, will become much more apparent as we go into some of the, uh, uh, the photos. That along the western part <laughs> here, it's very, very, very mountainous, leading into uh, fjords that uh, sort of lace this part here. And along that, along this, the, the Andes here, the side of the Andes, are these clusters. And this is where. Okay. <laughs> I thought I could reach back there. Well, okay. At any rate, it's very mountainous. And those white things are glaciers. Um, okay, so that gives you a bit of the, uh, the layout. Now we begin to start our travel from Punta Arenas to Puerto Natales. Ah, bueno. Uh, uh. This isn't my slide. Uh, I tried to take it, but we weren't positioned. So I got this from someone else. But I wanted you to see uh, something that is uh, pretty special about this area. As you can see, it's pretty, pretty remote, pretty desolate but it has its own stark, strange beauty as we were wending our way 150 miles through this. These trees aren't dead, but they're just trying to make it. They're very scrubby little trees that somehow <coughs> managed to gain purchase in this uh, rather uh, unforgiving soil. Now here is one of mine. Oops. Wrong zapper. <laughs> no, sometimes I'll, I'll get, I'll get, it. I'll get it. Sometimes a black and white uh, uh, photo can convey uh, some more of the mystery than even a color. And this one is uh, one place that was on this in these steps, and it sh and it shows uh, one of these really hardy trees trying to survive in amongst the rocks, overlooking a valley with the foothills and shrouded by clouds. And this gives sort of the sense of it being very lon uh, a very lonely place, but very, uh, very beautiful too. Uh, <laughs> sheep branches or estancias uh, dot this landscape. So it isn't as if it's uninhabited. And this is something you see quite, quite often. I don't think you can see that guy there, but that's one of the gauchos with his um, incredible border collie herding sheep. And this you see a lot. Um, it's um, uh, sheep herding, or she in fact, sheep ranching, uh, was introduced uh, to Patagonia and the middle 19th century by Spanish and, uh, and Croatians. I didn't realize that the Croatians had a, uh, that was one of their destinations during emigration, but it was. There's 
the, a lot of these estancias are, are still, still owned by, uh, or in the families of Croats. The gauchos uh, live a pretty lonely existence. They generally live in these uh, little abodes, and they cover hundreds of, of square miles with their, their grazing. The population density is only about one to two uh, uh, people per square mile. So there aren't very many. The, um, the guide that we had uh, to, to, uh, to help us negotiate this, uh, his wife is a physician who, whose practice was with these uh, shepherds. And she would go out into the countryside just to, uh, to care for them, which is, I thought was amazing. I guess they must have gone into Punta Arenas at least you know, once a year, stocked up, and then came back and said hi to the sheep. Here we are at the at, at, uh, Puerto de Tales. This is a beautiful spot. It sits at, at one end of a sound, the name of which is in Spanish, it's Celo Ultima Esperanza, which means the sound of last hope. I don't know why that's so. I didn't bother to find out. But it doesn't sound very good. But it's a very gorgeous place. This was a fishing village because this forms the inlet that comes off of one of the fjords, so it's salt water. Now, it's a uh, rather thriving place. Uh, and this again is from the internet because I wanted to give you a sense of this place. It's, uh, it's more than just a fishing village. And in fact, it's the, uh, it is the gateway to the Taurus del Paine. And it's also the Gore-Tex headquarters for all the trekkers that come down. Because those are the only, mainly the people that visit that place. It's about 150,000 a year that come into the park are mostly foreigners. And most of them, uh, not like us, they're on foot. And so they need lots of Gore-Tex. This I wanted to show you because it, uh, it, it kind of gives you, an, again, a, a little bit of a, uh, a sense of, of what's going on here. Here is our trek to Puerto de Natales. And this is the area, a very, very large area. And as you can see, this is just uh, laced with these fjords. So this has, um, and it's the southern tip of the Andes. And this is one of those clusters of mountains. I'm gonna show you a picture from NASA that'll, that'll give you a, um, Something you can't really process because it's from the air. But we're going to take a look at it from uh, down on the ground. But I thought a, a, a bird's eye view might be helpful. Anyway, we headed out the next morning from Porto, uh, Porto Natales into the mountains. And this is one of the typical scenes. This is a very large estancia in morning light. And you can see how, how magical that light is as it's illuminating the buildings and the grounds and whatnot. And with that in the background, I mean, I, I don't think I get off my veranda. <laughs> but here's this, this aerial view. And this is one of these clusters called cordillera, or massifs is another word for it. And you, you can see this, this I don't, I'm not a geologist, so I don't really know how these spring up as clusters. But this is the most gorgeous one. And you can, uh, one of the things that is sort of uh, the signature is what you see as a visitor from some angle. And the one angle that most people see is from this. And you see these huge spikes that are uh, peaks, but the Spanish call them cuernos, or horns. And uh, we, we'll see some of those uh, in a minute. But you can imagine uh, the trekking through here is, can be rather uh, 
interesting. <laughs> One of the things, though, look, that I was calling your attention to here are these three spikes. They're just weird because they stick up almost like needles, and they'll show up in several of the pictures that we'll see. This next shot is something I wanted to just show you how you make yourself, you make your way around that huge park with all those peaks. Now you don't see the peaks, but you have it in your mind. It's, it's more than just little circles here. But from Puerto Natales, you can, as we did, you pass through the gate, pay your fee, and then uh, you have access either on this main road, and these main roads are the same throughout uh, Patagonia. They're basically uh, good roads, but they're only two lane. I would say they're um, very much like Saxville Road, where we live. They're, they're, they're still very good. Uh, on the other hand, you can branch off and go on the dirt roads too, and those are lighter lines. Trekkers will, you can spend a day there, which is kind of silly. Uh, or, or some will do a five day and spend the time here doing kind of a W. And you'll notice that uh, all these places here are um, hostels or huts where trekkers can, can stay. Some of these places have um, uh, facilities, concessions, and whatnot. Others are very, very primitive. Also, you have the, uh, the campers can bring their own gear uh, and camp uh, in designated areas. You cannot leave the trail. Uh, they're very, very strict on that, and we'll see why in just a few minutes. Basically, it's because of fire. But for those who aren't trekking and are motoring, there are some really very, very nice hotels. You wouldn't expect in this remote area, but they're not dumb. And they, they, they really rake in a lot of revenue from tourists. And there was, we, there were hotels that, uh, that we stayed in here, here, and also in Puerto Natales over the nine, uh, nine days that were, were marvelous. I wanted to, and I'm going to show you one. When we came into Puerto Natales, uh, we were told we're going to stay at the Hotel Ramota. <laughs> well, I didn't really think too much of it until our van started up this dirt road. And we were met by this sign. I thought, oh. <laughs> and when, what do you expect with a wooden sign that says Ramota? And they couldn't even have one, but they had to have three. But as you as you came across the rise, uh, then you're met, and this, this uh, next one is, it's not a good slide, it's from the internet, but it gives you a sense of this five-star hotel that was uh, built in the, in the way of, of, of sheep runs. And they're grass-covered roofs, but with state-of-the-art kind of insulated windows and whatnot. And you'll notice that the ventilating systems are like shepherd's crooks. Uh, anyway, every single room, uh, there's, there's no such thing as a bad beat. Now, when you walk in the lobby, this is what you see. <laughs> and, uh, friends, the, 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 uh, the, the rates at this place are steep. but. For those people who are guests, it comes with a guide and a van, takes you anywhere in the park you want. We happened to get very good rates because we were the last people of the season. We're the only ones there. Uh, and so we had to eat up all their food. And, and it, was, it was absolutely marvelous. Um, this, this, again, we went in, in, the, uh, in late April, uh, which is like our late October, and it was, it was actually very nice. The temperature was maybe right around 50 degrees, but it oftentimes could get very, very windy. 
Now I want to start you on a, a little bit of a trek through the, around some of these peaks. This was like the first slide. And here are those, th those, those Quernos I was telling you about. You'll notice that something is really pretty interesting, and that is the, the bottom parts of these things. These are formed by, uh, obviously, uh, geological things, but also uh, uh, erosion. And so you'll notice that the tops of these are a lot darker than the sides. And the geological thinking is that these were all covered with sedimentary rock, but through the uh, millennia, uh, it just eroded away, um, leaving, for some reason, some of the sedimentary rock on top, but then pared down to the more resistant granite. And it, that's what gives it this, this, this really ethereal look. As you can say that these things like are, are coming out of the ground and they're, and they're black tops is the only thing you can see. It, it's truly amazing. This one I particularly like because down here you have the nice pastoral scene of all these wild horses uh, being <laughs> overlooked by these massive mountains. Here are those three spikes. And, okay, so you get a sense of the road, too, as it's winding through. Here are one of the few kinds of, of mammals that are found in this area. These are called guanaco. And uh, they're related to the llama, uh, the domestic, which, which is essentially a domesticated guanaco, and the wild vicuna of Peru. In uh, I think it's both, uh, Bev can correct me if it's wrong, but I think in most of Patagonia, these are protected, but they're not protected on Tierra del Fuego. So all the hunters are down there uh, <laughs> to try to get, but, but uh, there is a, uh, you, you, you can, uh, if you have a license, I guess, you can hunt these for game. <coughs> And in, uh, at, at our Remota Hotel, we were presented with guanaco. It's very, very tasty. Very nice critters. This is an, oh, the other thing I was going to say, the other, uh, the other mammals that range in that park are foxes and puma. Uh, and people will take, uh, trips there, like we did as photographers, but they will go there either to bird watch for, for uh, really amazing birds, or to puma watch. And if you're lucky, you get to see pumas. If not, you spend a lot of money, but you get to see nice, nice sights. But here is the, uh, uh, the cara cara, which is all over the place. Uh, this guy, <laughs> he, he was used to photographers, because our van pulled up, and someone said, oh, look there. And all the photographers came roaring out there, and they were all standing under there, click, click, click. And all he did was just green, green. <laughs> so it wasn't a difficult shot. This isn't a particularly good uh, photograph, but it illustrates something that is, is a problem. And that is, there aren't very many trees in this area, but the ones that are there are being lost to fire. And uh, the, uh, those that study this thing have said, well, this area here has been subject to fires uh, for uh, millennia. But in the last 25 years, it's been particularly bad because of uh, hikers. Now these people are not uh, irresponsible, but if you have you know, many hundreds of them, something's gonna go wrong. And when it goes wrong, it can be devastating. And over the last 25 years, they've had, um, well, first 70 uh, square miles, 
then another 55, then another 60, uh, be destroyed by a single backpacker. Just, just not doing something right or inadvertently doing something wrong. These are in different areas, but any place you go, you see the scars of these uh, things, and they're not coming back. So, but now on to prettier things. Here's an example. We, we, we stopped by this place on two or three occasions, but it, each time of the day, you see a different aspect of it. And this is in the afternoon. And you can see the way the light is playing on these things that didn't happen, of course, in, in, the, in the morning or whatnot. The way they're playing on, uh, on reflections in this glacial pond, and then on the, on the sides of these mountains. And not too far from here is, uh, this is actually the River Piney. Um, and it's, uh, it's really an incredibly beautiful river that as it's going through this gorge will then drop over a waterfall that takes your breath away. Yeah. And it's loud. Absolutely gorgeous. And here's another example of the way light can make all the difference in the world. You'll notice instead of being blue, this water here is gray. The name of the lake was Gray Lake. And the reason for it is that the head of this lake is a, a large glacier. And all that does is to move the sediment down so that there's always sediment being churned up and that colors the water. But here again are those ubiquitous three little spikes. This is not bad looking out of your bedroom window. Ah, the intrepid explorer. Uh, we were told this one day, he says, well, we're going to go on an adventure. I said, oh, I thought we'd been on an adventure. No, so we were taken down uh, to this place by a, a river that was going to lead up to uh, a, a, the head of a glacier, not the one that I just mentioned. And we thought, oh, that's nice, fine. Mm -hmm. Well, the only trouble is we were going to go in uh, zodiacs. Has anybody been in a zodiac? They're just like huge. Yeah, okay. So you, they're like huge rafts, and they're driven by outboard motors. And so these guys that run these things are real cowboys. And so they're really gunning them up. And it says, well, you've got to have, because that water's very cold, glacier, you've got to have these moon suits. And they're incredible. They are thermally uh, insulated, and they're waterproof. But once you put them on, you know what a diver feels like. Anyway, we head off, and, but no one told us that there were going to be two portages uh, of, well, they must have been at least 50 miles long. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, the end of this, uh, we, we, we finally got to our destination, and they say, well, it's about a mile in. I said, okay, we're gonna, shh. But they said, now you can take off your moon suit. So we did. And this was, this is what we were, that, 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 that. Now, uh, truth in advertising, I shot this too, but it wasn't all that good. It wasn't near as good. Uh, this was uh, of, um, a fellow traveler of mine, a fellow by the name of Val Guzman, who was a, a pathologist from Chicago, who was also a damn good photographer. And Val said, sure, sure, go ahead and use it. But this, this, is, uh, this, this is what he saw. This was, this was worth it. What was even more worth it was at the end of this adventure, as we go back over the porridges again, and dump our moon suits. They said, oh, well, now you have to come in and because we're going to feed you. And where these guys had their uh, outfit, where they rented all these things, 
they had a, a big house there. And in the house had a big dining room and a kitchen. And we came in, and this is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This table was spread, and they were served this marvelous lamb dinner with wine and whatnot. Well, you kind of forgot about the portages. <laughs> <laughs> now what I'd like to do is to take you through uh, a few pictures to show you what the light does to these peaks and how it really takes your breath away and it, it uh, sunrise and sunset. Now what I'm going to do is uh, this was actually on the balcony of one of the places that we stayed at. And all the you know, photographers are out there saying, ooh, ah, oh, oh, and have their tripods up. And, but now what I'm going to do is to use a, uh, a zoom lens and just to focus in on this. And you can see what, so it's, it's, it's absolutely magical what, what that does, including even painting the clouds in the sky. And then dotting uh, just all these little uh, protuberances in the, in the rocks. And on another spot, we can do the same thing. Uh, this is another place that we stayed. This is a, uh, some, those, those uh, three spires. And in the morning, you have also a much different but equally pretty thing. As the sun is rising here, it's illuminating just those surfaces here and also these little wispy clouds and then re reflecting in the water. And again, the morning shot where the, 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 uh, the sun, you say, how does it do that? I don't, I've not seen that here in Wapaka. But we have other things. I wanted to show you now a, uh, a few pictures taken by my friend and my guru, Dan Anderson. Dan, uh, uh, is, uh, his, his day job used to be a, as an endodontist. But he also apprenticed under Ansel Adams and helped teach workshops when he was with Ansel Adams. And Dan is, is really one of the premier landscape photographers. And he is the one that organizes these uh, adventures to all these neat places, because he's been there. But I wanted to show you some of Dan's work, because what black and white can do to change the feeling of, of uh, what is also pretty in color, but it strips away the color so that you can just see, just see form. And here are, oops, wrong zapper. And here's one of Dan's spot of, this, of those three spires. And you can, st what I liked about this so much was the, the. Um, the contrast with the, the terrain against those granite spires. Very, very nice. Okay, last part of the adventure. Um, we said, okay, today we're going to have a boat trip. And this is a boat, boat. it's not a zodiac. And we're going to go to visit the head of Gray Lake where the glacier is. And this is, again, uh, it's, it's nothing I took. It's, uh, it's a, a stock picture showing this is the, uh, the boat that we were going to uh, go in. Um, you'll notice that it has a, a, a sort of a walkway here and then a little deck here. But thank goodness it has an interior. Uh, we, again, <laughs> you, wanted, you, had, you had to want to do this because to get to this boat was also a trial, but we didn't have to wear moon suits. Uh, 
At any rate, we got in this, this boat, and the wind that day was really kicking up. And this guy was going up, it was about nine miles uh, up to the end of this, this lake, and he was heading right in the wind. And those waves were coming over the boat. <laughs> and I think, oh my God, <laughs> is this thing really seaworthy? <laughs> but it was, it was quite a, an experience. But along the way, if you didn't get seasick, you, you were also treated to some incredible formations of the rocks and these churning gray waves. Once you got to the glacier, the, the boats slowed down in the lee of the glaciers, and we got up pretty close, I'd say within about 50 yards of, of the glaciers. And it was, it was really an amazing feeling, because these things are towering. I don't, have you, I don't have a good picture to show you perspective, but um, I don't think our boat would be, it's probably a little bit smaller than this iceberg. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as you're traveling up here, you, there, it's just amazing to see all, all this ice being formed from the glacier that is going to calve, and also the striations in that. And this is simply due to the fact that um, the ice compacts at different places, um, forming these striations. And when it gets really compact and dense, it essentially squeezes the air out and then becomes a, a lot more light scattering. So that's why you see these dark blue. But this is very true of uh, uh, all those glaciers. Um, and that just gives you another sense. Now, the trip back. I need to tell you about this because it was one of the greatest boat rides I had. They treated us to tumblers of the Chilean-Peruvian national drink called Pisco Sour. And then, um, filled your glass with chunks of glacier ice. And uh, <laughs> for nine miles, you had a bottomless glass. <laughs> That's not a bad way to, I mean. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so I'm gonna end this by, by just a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of photos, again, showing uh, this it's a really incredible thing, the, the, the scenery. And uh, here's one tail end of one of these places that we stayed at. These were places that were, this place in particular, was licensed by the state to operate there. And what they did was that in the middle of, this is uh, Lake Pejo, uh, there was a small island, and what they did was to build a 200-yard-long uh, plank bridge and then put the hotel up on the island. So you were on this island, surrounded by this lake, and then had this, this view. Um, not bad. <laughs> and the last one is, again, another one of Dan's, which I really like. That's what's really neat. So, well, that's Patagonia. <laughs> or at least my version of it. <laughs> so if, you, if you have any questions, I think this is, this is certainly a bucket trip. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, some of us uh, who are really interested in photography said that there wasn't any venue for that in the area. So we formed 
a group that meets monthly um, and we given ourselves the, the, the really catchy name of the Midwest Photography Group. <laughs> well, you know, people had some other ideas, but I thought they were dorky. Um, but we meet once a week here in the library, um, and we invite people of, of all uh, levels as long as they're, you know, this is photography is something you were really interested in, to uh, come and share what you do, and you know whether you, you we have film photographers and digital, we have point and shoot. Bev gave a talk showing her wonderful Iceland shots that she took on her iPhone, and we have, of course, purists in this club. I said, oh, well, oh, I can't believe. <laughs> well, afterwards, the purist said, did you really take those with your iPhone? <laughs> so, so anyway, it's, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're interested, we, we do, have, we're on Facebook, so it's just uh, Midwest, or you can contact me. Uh, we have a meeting coming up on the, uh, um, Sir? Well, yeah, it's a th always the third Saturday, we meet from 10 to, to, to 12, um, and we, uh, we do, I mean, different, different people invite us out to do photo shoots at their place, because a lot of them live in some really nifty places, so whether birds or flowers or things like that. And then we do collective exhibits, um, one, one will be at the Jensen Center in Amherst, pretty soon. We had one last year at Mosquito Hill. So anyway, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, no one gets serious or gets bent out of shape. What kind of camera did you use for this trip? Uh, for this one, I was using a, a Canon 40D. Um, it's, um, it's an old uh, version, um, but it has a, uh, for those of you who are familiar with digital cameras, it does not have a full frame sensor, which means that if you're using, let's say, a, uh, a lens that has a 50 millimeter focal length, your focal length is really 70 millimeters because the sensor is smaller. And that can be a big pain, especially if you're shooting in low light. But here, when I wanted to get those peaks at, at, at sunset, that adds another 100 millimeters to my lens. And so all these guys with their super expensive cameras were howling, oh, I can't, I can't. I said, oh, too bad. Get a cheaper one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I know this wasn't an architectural talk, but I heard you talk a little bit about how the Remota, remember the Remota yeah. Hotel was Constructed? Bev can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, so yeah, she, 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 she went over this place uh, like she was going to write it up for um, travel magazine. <laughs> <laughs> um, like Mike said, it was built um, at, metaphorically like a sheep run. So when you saw pictures of it, you noticed that the, the angles of the, the wood that was holding it up were kind of tilted and asymmetrical, and that's because the sheep fences are like that in Patagonia. They don't, you know, they're old, and so they kind of tip over. And so the whole idea of that hotel was to mimic the fences um, that hold the sheep in. But more than that, the whole thing was constructed to look like it kind of grew up out of the ground. And that's why it had a, um, a grass roofs on the top. And it conformed to the lay of the land. So you, as you saw, I think maybe you could notice it was built on the side of the hill. And when you walked down the halls, they conformed to the hill. So you were walking down the hill in the hall in the hotel, and then there were floor-to-ceiling floor 
windows. So when you looked outside, it looked like you were walking down the hill outside. Of course, the rooms then were level when you went into the rooms, but the hall was on the same plane as the hill. So that was really interesting. And then the other thing is one time I was walking down the hall, and, and Patagonia can be very, very windy, especially at the time we were there and in the winter. And the wind was blowing really, really hard. And I looked up, and the walls were going, wum, wum, wum. <laughs> so I ran up to the receptionist and said, do you know the walls are blowing back and forth? And she said, yes, it was made to do that. Um, to, to go back and forth with the wind so that um, it, would not, it would not be resisting the wind and therefore um, be a much more um, appropriate structure for that area. So it was just a, a very, very interesting, ecologically well thought out structure and um, I've not been in anything like it before. Yeah, I'm wondering, you said you were there in April and it was the end of the season. What are their seasons for the tourists and what do they do after if, if you were there at the end? Um, well, I think it was just that being the end of the season, I don't think that means that it's the... I, I really don't know whether they close the park. I doubt it. But... Um, uh, it's just that the accommodations, the hotels, uh, uh, s stop serving uh, at that point, which is right at the end of April. And they probably open up then sometime in, you know, like November, like, like you know, like, yeah, like, like Door County would, would, except turning the hemispheres around. Um, uh, so the tourist season would be something like November, through uh, to April, something like that. Um, I, I don't think it ever gets too warm there, because you're, I mean, you're down pretty far south. But I, I don't think it also gets uh, very cold, because we asked uh, our, our, our guide, um, and he said, oh yeah, we'll, 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 you know, we'll, we'll get snow, but not, uh, unless it's up in the mountains, uh, in the steps part of the Patagonia, it's, 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 not, it's not terribly deep. But the fact is that because of the wind, you know, the windshield can just sort of get to you. That, that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. There is another question? Yeah. Um, I had a question about the glaciers. Yeah. Being the end of April, of course, the glaciers would have receded over their summer season. But is there any question of any more long-term uh, retreat of the glaciers there? Like, I, I don't know, but I suspect that uh, there, like any other place, they, they are. Um, I, I, I just don't know uh, whether the rate is the same as in uh, more um, compromised areas. We were, we were in Iceland this summer and they commented that uh, the glaciers there were, uh, I mean, they were receding incredibly fast. You know, they are in Greenland. Too. And Greenland, too, uh, because they have those, these, what they call big uh, ice lagoons. Yeah. And a few years ago, when you went to this, one of these lagoons, you could perhaps see two or three calved uh, glaciers, and now the place is just filled. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't be surprised, but this is also pretty high up. But yeah. uh, uh, it's a good question. Yeah, I, I, about that. Um, I remember our guide in Patagonia saying at one point that all of the glaciers mm -hmm. in that park were res were receding, except for one, mm -hmm. which in fact was growing, and they did not know why that was. They had no idea why. Most of them are receding and one was growing. Thank you. Yeah, that's weird. Thank you, Michael.